on air, online, on your smartphone. Two and you are FM 103.7. As we take a look at some of the things happening in the world of education, we do that with uh, Professor John Fischetti out of the University of Newcastle, who, as uh, always, suit, tie, badge, everything on, and uh, the black T-shirt not quite cutting. And, mate, as always, thanks and welcome for smartening up the joint as well. Uh, my pleasure, Mark. Always aim to please. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, you've turned up. That's kind of what we're talking about today is school attendance by... Uh, some reports that uh, school attendance is down by up to 60%. What is the benchmark for being, I guess, fully attended as opposed to dropping below an acceptable level? So, Mark, one of these old school pieces of data that we can still use, the number one predictor of whether you're not you'll do well in a course is actually showing up to it. And for kids, it's equal to that. So isn't that kind of nice that in 2023, we're still using something like attending as a criterion? Who would have thought, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere over 90% is really required to do your best. There's a lot of reasons why it could flow below that, and that runs to illness, bushfires, floods. A lot of our state has had a lot of that. So you have to factor that into some of the data. Look at the northern part of New South Wales in the last couple of years. A lot of folks unable to attend the school, the school was washed away. So that's not a, one piece of it. But in this, there's some really interesting possible causes for why kids may not be showing up to school. All right. So if we take out those obvious beyond anyone's control scenarios, like a school is closed, you can't get to a school, um, are there some other disturbingly high parameters that we're seeing jump up in the, the data data here? Well, it's the most vulnerable young people that may be not attending. And this is true globally, so it's not just an Australian phenomenon. But let me give you three reasons. And all of these are accumulative. There's not one major cause. Over the last three years, the opportunity to go to school has been taken away through lockouts, lockdowns that have met in many countries, including in our own state. There was times when school really wasn't the place to go. Uh, Many of people who live with vulnerable family members and a grandmother for, by chance, and they were worried about risking them going. So some students were staying home. They were Zooming in, et cetera. The effects of that have meant that some kids really just don't prefer to go back. Uh, in the U.S., there are hundreds of kids in there. Some of their high schools have 2,000 to 2,400 students, hundreds of students that just haven't come back in the last couple of years. It just not in school. They've chosen to just disappear. In New South Wales last year, 30% of the year 12 class just didn't finish. So I'll call that the COVID funk that uh, mm. we're in. And that may not be the number one reason, but it might be a few percentage points. First of all, high school with two and a half thousand students, massive joints. <laughs> oh, for sure. imagine being the deputy in that yeah, school. Good, good oh luck. my gosh. Yeah, you, An <laughs> you only ever get to learn the bad kids' names. Another <laughs> reason that seems to be extending f during the time kids had flexibility at home, they were able to choose their own adventure. Yeah, you could do this notion of self-regulation we've talked about a lot of times. So maybe even did chemistry class with flour and sugar in the kitchen. That's what you had, so that's what mm -hmm. you used. Now it's kind of boring. You're sitting there, teachers are talking, there's worksheets, there's bells. It's like, oh boy, this again. So a lot of kids are just now disengaged. They're not sick. It's not a flood. It's just, I don't want to go. And the third reason would be distractions. And those distractions can come from like gaming till two in the morning with friends around the world and kind of not getting up or parents having to rush off to work and maybe not able to get the kids up uh, and or working so late. A number of our young people work in jobs that are at the minimum wage. They work in drive throughs or other situations which push them late into the day. They're really not supposed to work that late, but businesses are kind of... Uh, talent short. And so many places now here and around the world are having kids be really sleepy from 14 up. So you might think that's a 16 year old issue, but actually we have a lot of kids 14 and up who are working way too late and they're just distracted and, and nodding off or never waking up. Yeah. What was that magic number 14 and nine months? It, it could have changed, but that, that that's what it was anyway. Um, and let's be honest, John, I mean, the, the idea of, oh, now I can work, I can have some money to go out on the weekend. But if it if it's penalising what's happening at school, that's the, um, you know, that's becoming an issue. Is there some reliable data overseas where there has been a change in all of a sudden a lot more kids into the workforce that we have seen a, a downtrend here? A couple of states in the U.S are pulling back child labor laws. Arkansas is one of them. Uh, the former president's press secretary, Huckabee Sanders, uh, you might remember her name for some Saturday Night Live bits and other things you might have saw. She's the governor in Arkansas, and she's pulling back child labor laws to let students of school age work however long they want and as early as they can get in. 
Those jobs, unfortunately, though, you know, they're dead ends in the sense that they're menial labor. Once they can be automated, they will. They're just filling in jobs until the machine can do it just as smartly. And it means those kids out of school are not preparing themselves for their own future, and we're taking it away from them because there won't be that lower-level job very shortly if it is there today. In Australia, it's a little better, but what I worry about is we can't afford with 25 and a half million people to have a group of young people not being totally keen, getting to school, doing their bit, getting ready to be part of this innovation age that we're in. If we lose them, they'll be falling on the dole. They'll be falling on their parents or they'll be falling out of uh, good times into making choices that all have costs. And I think the encouragement comes, and this is where the positive we can finish with, Mark, is that young people who feel there's something worth doing this is true at university as well, tend to show up. So if they know they're going to get involved, if they know they're in a caring place, if they know somebody's going to know their name and there's somebody who's going to look out for them, they're going to get something out of it. They'll get up out of bed. It's a, it's a miraculous that if there's a game on at 8 a.m. you know, around the world, they'll be up. They'll be there. And so we got to make it relevant. we got to make it engaging. That's not new information. But this attendance data gets skewed immediately when kids feel there's something worth getting up for. And if they're going to a place, they're going to feel like they can be themselves and not be bullied, but also be challenged in the right way. So all we got to do is make it relevant. And all of a sudden, they're there. Relevant with a little bit of fun and uh, seeing that some hope and purpose at the end of it, John, probably uh, a nice uh, a nice mix to have there. As always, a pleasure, mate. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mark. A professor of education from the University of Newcastle, John Fischetti, who we're giving him 100% attendance for this year so far. Well done. On 2NURFM 103.7. A broadcast service of the University of Newcastle.